How are you? Good? Good? Okay, okay. So, um, so we're going to talk about discovery today. And Alan Flurry, my, my good friend, when he saw the name of the talk this afternoon, he went, so discovery? Like, what's, what's going on here? What, you know, why, why would you be doing this? And, and this actually came about a couple of weeks ago when I was asked to write a chapter in a book about leadership with women in technology. And I was, as I was going through and thinking about what is it that I would write about, and they were asking us to write about our personal experiences, I really thought, how do I write about something that I didn't even know I was doing? Because what I would say is, is that in my life, and as I've gone through my life, and as I've had adventures and leadership adventures and gone through all the different journeys of life, what I found was that I was really working in the environment that I had at that time. You know, there were a lot of things going on. If things had to be done, I did them. If I needed help, I would get them done. If it felt good, I would go, ooh, this doesn't feel good, I would try something else. If it felt good, then, you know, I would do something and, and I kept on going. So I thought, how in the world do we talk about leadership in a way that really makes sense? And what happened was, my aha was, golly, you know, the conversation, at least for me, about leadership is really a conversation about looking back and assessing what happened and what was the cause and effect. But in reality for me, leadership is living fully in the present moment. So I thought, well, let's talk about discovery. Let's talk about discovering who we are. Let's talk about discovering what shows up in our life and what are those ways that we can impact the world. Because at the end of the day, we all would love to live a happy and joyful life. And we want to have impact. We want to contribute and we want to participate in the world. And it is up to each of us to discover what that path is. So I'm gonna, we're going to talk about some examples today. I'm going to use me as an example of what I discovered about myself in a little bit, just sort of you know, how I got to where I am today. And then I'm a social entrepreneur now. And life has led me to this path called TechBridge. So I want to talk a little bit about business and social entrepreneurship and the models and how we look, about, look, look at various parts of our life and you know, how we can maybe change ourselves and change the world while we're at it. Okay? So, so this is about discovery. Now, the pictures that, that you will see here today are photographs that I've taken from my trips sort of around the world in different places. And this happens to be a picture of downtown Antigua. And so the idea here also is that as we go through and we do the discovery process, there are things that are happening in different dimensions. And sometimes we can see them, and sometimes we can't. Sometimes we're like the people on the ground, and sometimes we look up and it looks like clouds. And then, there, then we see, oh my gosh, there is another mountain. I never saw that. Here I was walking the street. And all of a sudden, I look up, and there's a mountain to climb. So, so for me. There are three key things that I have discovered and that I want to share with you all today. And my invitation to you is take what you like and leave the rest. Because I know that each of us has the wisdom in our own being, in our own spirit, to choose the path that's right for us. So take what you like and leave the rest. So the first part of it is understanding ourselves and our relationship to the world. So the Tao Te Ching is a book that was written by um, Lao Tzu, who is an ancient Chinese philosopher. And this is one of my favorite sayings. For those of you in the room who have heard me before, you always know that this appears. So it is a, is it a thread in my tapestry. And basically, it goes like this. Knowing others is intelligence. Knowing ourself is true wisdom. Managing others is strength. Managing ourselves is true power. So the idea of leadership and understanding ourselves in connection with the world, it's not just about everybody else, it's not just about me, but somehow it's about the mystery of myself and knowing myself and being in myself and participating with the world. And so that's, that's sort of key number one. That's the that is the discovery. Who am I? And who, am, who is the world? And who am I in the world in relationship with each other? Now, I have a math degree. 
So I would love this because the math brain is essentially one of bringing together patterns and things from disparate sets. It's not about arithmetic. It's about bringing patterns together. So of course, this is sort of a natural place for me. Point number two, be curious. Never lose a holy curiosity. Because not only did Albert Einstein suggest that to us, but he also said that the current problems cannot be solved at the level of consciousness that created them. So that means that we have to be curious. We can't necessarily say, this worked yesterday, so it's going to work today. So that curiosity is something that is really, really important. So I'm gonna, we're going to have a little exercise here today. We'll get sort of you all moving and, and just play around with this a bit. Okay? So I'd like everybody to stand up. Ha ha. I know. Here you thought you're going to sit down, you're going to take notes, you know, you're going to text your best friend who's not here. Okay, so, so we're, so we're, we're going to do this. The students who are in my class when I taught here understood that there was going to be at least once, if not twice, if not three times, that they were going to get up out of their seats and we were going to move a bit. So, so the first thing I'd like for you to do is take a look and be curious about what you see. Just kind of look forward, don't look to the right or the left, but be curious about what you see. So what is it that, that you see? Pardon? Wait, what do you see? Shout it out. A trail. A trail. Okay, great. You see a screen. You see a trail. Um, you see the front, 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 front of the room. Okay. Now just take a minute. Take a breath. Notice what you see. Now I would ask you to take a quarter turn to the right. Great. Good job. Okay. And you even got the right, right. So that that's cool. Now, now notice right now in that quarter turn. What do you see? A wall, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Be curious, be curious to be able to move. A simple turn, the ability to turn, all of a sudden gives you a totally different perspective. Now turn back to the front. And the other reason why we want to do this is that when, our, when we get our bodies engaged, we remember more. So our mind remembers a lot of things, but when our bodies move and we're engaged in it, you know, it sort of settles in a bit more. So now what I'd like for you to do is take a quarter turn to the left. Ha! Now what do you see? Windows, draperies, all those kinds of things. If I ask you how, if, and if I said right now, looking that direction, said we have to leave the room right now, how would you leave? That, well, this is all that you see. You'd, you'd say, oh my gosh, we have to break through the windows. Let's go. Okay, but now take another quarter turn to the left. Voila. There are doors back there. There's a whole other window of people watching you, you just not watching what's up here. Now all of a sudden you have a totally different view. Now take another quarter turn to the left. Voila. And here we are. A whole different view. This is what it means to be curious. Now there's a more, you can turn, turn around now. So there's a moral to this story. Anybody know the moral? Okay, here, here it is. Vantage points, simpler than that. Three lefts make a right. Ah, she was going to say that. Okay, have, have, have a seat. Oh, you're not going to say that. Okay, well, you could have said, oh, yeah, I, that, I had that answer. Okay. So, so the idea is, is that how many times do we go, I need the right answer? And that sometimes that works well for an engineering problem or a calculus problem. But there are a lot of times in life, in terms of leadership, and in terms of being in the present moment, that there really is no right answer. So any time that we think about, you know, I have to be right, my invitation to you is to be curious instead. Take a look. Remember to take a quarter turn to the left and to the right and see what you see. So the third part of this is, Helen Keller said, life is a daring adventure or nothing at all. In the business world, we do a lot and we talk a lot about change. Oh, we're going to change and how we're going to bring change about and what does change mean and let's talk about it and let's get everybody moving for it. But the thing of it is, is that life flows all by itself. There is no moment that is the same as the moment before. And that's what this stream reminds us, that the water flows over this one rock one time. So not only is change there, it's that the flow of life is with us all the time. And we see it because the morning comes and the morning goes. 
and we have some days we feel well for all of you all who are athletes you know that someday you're at your best and you go this is great I'm a yoga person so some days I get into all those moves and my muscles I can do all kinds of things and other days there's nothing that I can do to get me in the pose so we know that life has its flows and its ups and its down and so you know the, so the third part about it is just really embrace life's flow so number one be curious about our relationship with ourselves and the world. Number two, be curious. Number three, embrace life's flow. So what does this really mean? So I'm gonna be here an example. When I was your age, I was at Purdue University. When I went into Purdue, I went into an honors math program. I had been in a small high school, all girls high school, there was nothing called calculus in our math curriculum. In fact, when I was a sophomore, I thought that I was going to flunk out of math because I couldn't do word problems. I couldn't decipher them. I couldn't interpret them. And a nun, I went to a Catholic high school, a nun sat through and she said, here, here's how you decode this and this is how this works. So I, so I almost gave up math. And then I found a doorway and then I went to Purdue and then I was in an honors math program. So Purdue is much like Georgia Tech. And freshman calculus, there's everybody on the campus, all the new freshmen. I mean, we're all going to calculus class. And there are, you know, uh, rooms like this, only, only larger probably, with 200, 300 people in it. And I found myself, because I was in an honors program, in a small classroom in an old building, and the professor comes in, he goes, not only are we going to learn calculus, but here is a coding sheet, and we're going to learn how to use computers and calculus all at the same time. This was 1970, so it's a long time ago. Computers were buried in the basement of a sciences building at Purdue, and you had to have a certain code to be able to get in. And all of a sudden, there I was. And most of the students in my class were high school students of Purdue professors who had already tested into the honors. honors. And so I asked them for help. I was the only woman in the class, and that in and of itself, that day I began to learn and began to see the benefit of relating technology to something else. And from that day on, I was hooked. So I got, an, I got a minor in operations research. So I studied economics, I studied sociology, I studied engineering. You know, we, I took classes in the business school. The math professors at Purdue said, don't even bother taking a business class or an accounting class. And I said, well, why is that? And they go, well, it's just arithmetic in two dimensions. So, I, so, I, so you know, it wasn't until I got to be a junior or senior that I said, you know, maybe I ought to get an accounting class and understand really, really how this, this works. So the first part of my life was really about living the life I thought I needed to live. And so I got out of school. No one was hiring Phi Beta Kappa honors highest honors graduate Purdue Math in 1970, except for technology companies. So that door opened and I walked in, and I've been there ever since. And so what happened was I started working in technology companies, we started programming things, and all of a sudden I found myself on every single new project that came along. So I helped create the first ATM systems, the first bank card systems, we did something called computer capacity management, where we figured out how computers worked. We started working with hardware and software monitors and did all kinds of cool things. And then I went to Pete Marwick in New York. I was actually had worked for a bank in Louisville, Kentucky, and then went to Pete Marwick in New York, where we said, how do we make this even bigger than just one? So we started saying, OK, banks, technology, how do we relate that? Then at that point, I looked at the business model in terms of Pete Marwick, and I said, you know what? don't like the business model. The reason why I didn't like the business model is for two reasons. Number one, at that time, there was only one woman partner inside Pete Marwick. She was in the consulting practice in technology in California. So I looked and said, hmm, this doesn't look very promising. But the other reason was that the business model really didn't work for me. Because what happened was in the consulting business, you work an hour and you bill an hour. You work an hour and you bill an hour. So I said, well, maybe there's another way to be able to do this, and I need more experience. So I went to Louisville, Kentucky, got married, went to Louisville, Kentucky, and I started working for Humana. And Humana had put in 
uh, was uh, they were in the hospital business, in the insurance business. What they tried to do was put a hospital system in the doctor's offices, and it didn't work. And we said, and they said, we need somebody to do that. So we said, okay, let's. And I ran that. So we were working with folks who had never used computers, and we put them into computers. So we were teaching people how to use computers, how not to use pegboards. We were figuring out how to how to do and how to build business systems for HMOs when we didn't even know how to spell HMO, much less how to build a business system, how to be able to do it. So this idea of adoption of technology, how do we adopt technology, how do we as individuals work with this technology was really key. And then I got the entrepreneur bug because I, I realized that a lot of times people said, slow down, you have to do it this way and this is what we're doing. And I got to do venture capital investing for Humana. So I got to look at all kinds of biotech companies, supercomputing companies, nanotechnology companies, and it was like really cool. And I said, golly, you know, here's a place where I just get to do what I know how to do. I get to keep learning all the time, and we're going to see what happens. It's like being a, a PhD student in a Georgia Tech lab. We're going to play with it. We're going to see what happens. We're going to work real hard. We're going to see if it works. If it doesn't work, and off we go, and we're going to do something else. So that's exactly what I did. Eventually, I became an entrepreneur and it helped build two technology healthcare services companies. One we did, we recovered the cost of accidents for health insurance companies. I built the company on the sales side. We had 13 employees and we had three small contracts. By the time I turned sales over to the person who took my place, we did work with all the major insurance companies and, and had, did work with 27 million people across the US. I went from there and then came to Atlanta. And the reason why I came to Atlanta was in my life and in that curious moment, everything that I knew in my life blew up. My marriage, the company that I worked for, I was at that point CEO, and they decided to sell the company and bring the, the original CEO back because they thought they could get more money for the company, and it all blew up. Everything that I thought I was or could do all of a sudden just vanished. The Buddhists would call this a critical eruption. And at that point, I looked and I said, I know what I've done, but I guess I'm supposed to be doing something else. And it was from that point on that I got really curious. That's why I know to be curious, because everything that I knew that I could depend on all of a sudden changed in a flash. So what happened was I came to Atlanta. My daughter now is 24. She decided to stay in Louisville, Kentucky with her dad. And I came down and said, what does my life look like now? I know what it looks like in the business world. I thought what I knew what it looked like in the family world. I thought I knew my relationship with my daughter and my family and all of that. And yet all of that changed. So I got to sort of start over. And I started to say, in terms of going with the flow, I had to go with the flow. There was no other way to hold on except to really go with the flow. So I found myself in Atlanta. The opportunity opened up in Atlanta, and I restarted a clinical da database company, raised $7 million of capital, and then began to see what we could do with that. And it was a great ride. And then one day, our lead investor, his fund collapsed, and we closed the company down. So I, I'm somebody who says, and one of the reasons why I'm here today is, it took me a long time for the universe to go knock, 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 pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. So I said, so I got really curious again, and that's when I began studying quantum physics, metaphysics, and looking and saying, how does the world really work? We think we make these decisions with our minds, but in fact, all the decisions that we make, we make from a different place. And where is that place, and what is that range? And that's what brought me back to, back to Atlanta. I studied and did a lot of work abroad, came back to Atlanta. That's when Terry asked me if I would come and do things here at Georgia Tech and teach, and I said yes. And then TechBridge came into my life. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So this idea of life and coming into itself. So right now, when you look at Kathleen Curry, what you really see is you see a person who's made a conscious decision to live my life fully and to have everything in my life intersected. So when young people ask me about balance, I say, is it balance that you really want, or is it to be happy? Because when you're living a full life and you've got lots of interest and you've got lots of love in your life and you've got lots of things that you can do, you're going to have a really hectic life. So jump in and enjoy it and, and let the present moment lead you into what you want to do next. So I've worked in corporate America. 
I've built entrepreneurship companies. I've invested in entrepreneurship companies. Um, I've taught here at Georgia Tech. I love teaching, you can tell. You can just look at me and you go, yeah, she loves to teach. So why would I go to TechBridge? Well, I went to TechBridge because that door is the one that opened. TechBridge was started 10 years ago by three entrepreneurs who said nonprofits need to have access to technology like for-profits do, and they started TechBridge. I happened to be the third CEO, and it was time to bring sort of new life and to look at it and do something new in terms of creating tech, tech bridge. So when I was here teaching entrepreneurship, um, you know, I said every, every company goes through a life cycle. So when a company starts, it looks one way, and then you have to change it a number of times. So you know, when a company is eight, five to six, seven years old, probably the business model that got you there isn't the one that's gonna take you into the growth sector. So it was really right there at the right time. But the real part of it is, is that real passion of saying, how can you put technology in a sector that is heart-driven, and what do those models look like, really was a very fascinating part for me to be in. So the only thing that I knew was how to say yes. And I said yes. So I went in, and what I would say is, that it's very easy, you know, I have a lot of experience, so it was very easy to put my CEO hat on. You know, I looked at the income statement, I looked at the operating margin, I looked and went to talk to our customers, all those things that you would expect us, expect, expect someone new to go in to do, I did. But I knew that the company needed, needed to be fundamentally changed. And at the end of the day, you know, I had to <coughs> say whether or not I was willing to do what it really took to take the company to the next le level whether I was really willing to go deep and to change the team and change the strategy and really do the work that needed to be done. At that point, it was a really, somebody asked me the other day, we, brought, we were interviewing for a new position and somebody said, why did you go to TechBridge? And I said, I can tell, I can answer that question really well. But the real question is, why did I stay at TechBridge? So when we go and we, we say yes and we find a place to lead and we find a place to contribute, we see it and it all looks really nice and we say, okay, this is a challenge and then we get in and we say, well, it doesn't quite look what I thought. It's a lot harder work than I thought. How am I gonna do this? Look at all these things that I thought I knew how to do. I'm not sure I know how to do that in this environment. I did it in this, the other environment, but I'm not sure I know how to do that here now. And there's this wonderful book that is written by a poet by the name of David White, W-H-Y-T-E, and it's called The Heart Aroused. And basically, he's written books about coming to, to, coming to face with yourself in the business world when you know that you can't really control anything and when you just get to do what you know how to do. And it's like, for those of you who love reading literature, it's like reading The Odyssey, it's like reading Beowulf, and it's like being able to say, am I gonna continue and where is this going to happen? So within the first 45 days at TechBridge, I had to let five people go. We had to go talk to customers. We had to do a lot of things. Plus we had to figure out who we were in the next stage of our life. So what is it that we learned? So I'd like to talk a little bit about social entrepreneurship and I'd like to talk about biz business models. So the first thing is, and this kind of goes into it, is there's a place of being an individual and being in business where you go back and forth between confusion and clarity. So I walked into TechBridge, I took a look at all the facts, and I said, well, I think I know what I need to do. But on the other hand, there were, it was right at the uh, fall of 2008, in the fall of 2008, the economy was taking all kinds of hits, and I knew that these people had jobs. I have a master's of divinity. So I said, so, and I get up every morning and I sit and contemplate and meditate, and compassion and kindness are part of who I am. And I go, how do I do this? How do I bring, how, do I, how am I a CEO and need to do the things that need to be done and be compassionate all at the same time? And I will say, that there were a lot of sort of dark nights of the soul, if you will, in terms of how do I do this and what does this really mean? It was a lot easier before I understood that about myself because I said, here's what you do, here are the rules, I know how to make decisions and know how to make choices and, and off we go. So there's that place, it's just like turning left and turning right 
when it's not clear, it's not clear. And then, and then there's a moment where you go, I know that I have to do this. And I will say the day that I walked in and knew that I needed to let five people go, and I was going to affect five people's families, I walked to the door of TechBridge and said, I wish I could just turn around and walk away. Because that was a really hard thing to do. But it had to be done. And it was a good thing to do. But it was still just because I was still clear on what that direction meant, uh, what that direction needed to be, it didn't make it any easier to actually do. And I had all the input. I got our board involved. We ran the numbers. We did all kinds of things. You know, all of all of the HR stuff, all of the dot. You know, everything was done the way it needed to be. But still, I still had to go in and do that and understand why I did it and what the value of the company was. And basically, one of the reasons why that happened was in that role, I said, we've got TechBridge is the IT department for 40 nonprofits here. So Points of Light Institute, you walk into the Atlanta History Center, we take care of the technology. Gateway 24-7, homeless shelter, technology. They get on the internet because TechBridge is there. They can process transactions because TechBridge is there. We do that for 40 nonprofits with 16 people. We also host 90 websites. And we host emails. And we're putting in transformative technology into nonprofits. So I said, if I don't do this, and if we can't be the company that we came here to be, what happens to the community? What happens to the other employees that, that are here? And so those are the kinds of decisions in the way that we said, this is what needs to happen. But confusion and clarity sort of sit side by side. Organizations and cultures. So I have a flip chart here. And um, one of the things that was really difficult, difficult because I did take a break from the business world for about um, five, five years as I was getting my divinity degree. I have a company called Fusion Advisors, which I worked and do a lot, did a lot of consulting. So one of the things I sort of played around with, and particularly when I went to TechBridge, is, is everybody wanted sort of an organization chart. You know, what does this chart look like? And, I, and so the board's here, and you've got different people, and they report to people and all that kind of stuff. And people would walk into my office, and they go, well, you're the CEO. What do you want to do about it? And I would say, well, what do you want to do about it? And everybody looked at me like, you know, you're supposed to know. You're supposed to be in charge. Make a decision. You're the leader. But I looked at them, and I said, but I can't do what you do. And I started looking at the organization chart, and I said, well, there's a problem here because in classic hierarchy organization charts, none of these boxes talk to each other. Everybody sits in their little silo. So who is it that really takes care of the company in terms of how it works? So, so what I did one day is I said, we're going to have a new organization chart. And it is going to look like a mandala, which is basically, if you think about a rose and petals on the rose. And the idea of our culture and how we're going to run this is that we're all going to get really clear on what we're here to do and why we're here to get that done. And we're going to make it really clear that we're all petals. So for me personally, what I say to our team, I'm just another petal on the mandala, just another petal. I bring my own capabilities, my own expertise, and I'm going to contribute that to the community just like you do. So when we move the culture from who is it that makes all the decisions, not my problem because this is my box, to a culture that goes, wait a minute, the health of our community relies on me. It relies on me. And that's what we started doing with our team. When you go out to a, to a client, rather than just fixing what's broken for a computer, because we take care of a whole bunch of different kinds of technology, rather than fixing just what's broken, ask this question, is it going to work when I leave? And how do we make that work? Because if I don't make that work for the nonprofit when I leave, they're not going to have technology, and that person's not going to be able to find a room tonight to stay in if they're homeless, if our technology doesn't work. So that, was, so that culture and that basic part of that organization of moving it to a new paradigm is really important. So that first, the team didn't really get it. They just said, I just want to do what I'm doing. But then eventually they got it, and we've got other people who, are, you know, who come in and they sort of, sort of get it. So when people come into TechBridge, we draw a mandala and say, this is our or or organization chart, and this is how we work, and this is what we do, because everybody adds value, and everybody allows us to be health healthy. 
Now, one of the other parts of the aha in terms of the org organizations and cultures is, and I had this, this other kind of thing, is that in terms of Kathleen and in terms of what the organization needed, there were a lot of times when I say, can I bring the right blend of skills that the organization needs and what does an organization need? So there's some work that's done based upon the Myers-Briggs and personality styles which says that we all have a unique way in which we address, in which we participate in organizations. There's those of us who inspire organizations. There's those of us who run organizations. There's those of us who are in service to organizations. And there's those of us who design organizations. And in order for companies and businesses to really succeed, we need all of these to happen. And we need to have people who serve them and inspire them and run them and all that. And one of the big ahas for me personally was that I am naturally an inspirer. But I have a job as a CEO, which means that my job has some inspire in it. But particularly for the first 18 months of TechBridge, I had, I had a lot of inspiring to do. But every day, I also had to figure out how to run the business. So you're looking at the payroll clerk, the benefits clerk. You're looking at the budget analyst, the financial an analyst. You know, that's, <clears throat> that's me and my roles. Because in order for that company to run, those are the kinds of things that, that have to get done. And so what happens is, is for all of us, as we think about what our life path is, where are we here, and how do we really want to serve? And the aha for me one day was, oh my gosh, Rather than saying on the days when I was having to do all the, the running and all the administrative work, I was functioning as a chief administrative officer, and I really wanted to do that. My aha to bring this into wholeness was I have just expanded my range. So not only can I inspire, but I can run the, the organization, and whatever need, is needed at the moment, I can do. And so what happened was, I was able to find basically my own mandala in terms of being able to connect those parts of me that heretofore I wasn't really sure. Because in my early career, I ran things. People told me I inspired them as well. But I was there to run things. In the middle part, as I was looking at this, I was, you know, my job in, in getting a divinity degree is you're inspiring people. So now I'm back as a CEO. And for my own personal journey, I found that and I found it connected. So organizational cultures and how we run them. I believe that your generation is the generation that is going to move us into mandalas in terms of how we organize ourselves and how we contribute to community. The uniqueness is one that's really important in the nonprofit sector because there there's a lot of conversation in the industry about how nonprofits should run like business. I would say a lot of times there are a lot of businesses that don't run very well. We've just gone through a period of seeing that act actually happen. So, so the idea is, why should anybody run like somebody else? We should run like we are. So it's like um, in the medical business, for so many years, uh, women were treated, and heart attacks were treated in women like they were treated in men. That has now changed, and is changing over the last five to six years. But they said, well, we'll study a man's body, and we'll just say it works for a woman. There was, there was a time when people said, well, we're going to treat children like, like small adults. So we're going to sort of draw these relationships. So the nonprofit sector, in terms of technology, really has its own adoption curve. And so and one of the things about the nonprofit sector is, is that they do work that a lot of the for-profit companies can't do because they're taking care of people in terms of where they are. They're educating children. They're taking care of homelessness. They're taking care of all kinds of things that don't have a known result. So it's a very important sector about how we not only take care and how we consider our community to be, but also the work to be done. So once you, you know, when you take a look, um, uh, Margaret Wheatley wrote a book called Leadership in the New Science. And one of the things that she talks about is that leadership a lot of times is built like the old industrial model, which is if you do this and that's going to happen. So we'll get so that, that idea of uniqueness in, that, in the mandala is that not that nonprofits have to work like a business, but they have to work for what the work that they're here. So this morning, I gave a talk to 70 technology folks from a national large nonprofit. And we were talking about particular technology called SharePoint. It's Microsoft technology. And they said, well, we built a SharePoint portal, but the people who are taking care of you know, the homeless people and our missions and all that, they don't want to use SharePoint. 
So, you know, they don't want to adopt technology. And I said, well, then the technology doesn't work for them. So let's go and let's ask people what they need the technology to do, how it would help them in the work that they do, and let's start from there. And that was actually one of the things that we did in the clinical database com com company when we were doing work for doctors. We said, let's solve their problem, not our problem. So we turned the, so we turned the whole question on its head. And so we said the business problem we solved there was if you're a cardiologist and you're in a 10 physician group, you get a call at 2 o'clock in the morning, 90% of the time you're not going to know who that person is. And you're not going to have seen them. Person's in the hospital having a heart attack. You're getting called. You don't know who that person is. So we said, we're going to put some data, and we're going to give you access to data at home. What do you need? And the doctor said, we need two things, allergies and meds, because we're going to prescribe a drug until it give us time to get to the hospital to do more work, and we're, we're going to direct the ER team on the way. So we had this whole group of PhDs. Everybody's talking about, we need this data, we need that data, all those kinds of things. And that ability to say the uniqueness of the sector and what is the physician's job is to help that person who is sick. So let's get the data there. So the idea of technology and nonprofits is actually of leadership, is being able to say what is that uniqueness that we're really trying to address. So what is success if you're a social entrepreneur? Jim Collins said it really, really well. He wrote the book Good to Great, and he's got an appendium for nonprofits. Muhammad Yunus said it well when he was here at the first part of the semester which is when you're in the for-profit business, money is an input and an output, okay? Money is an input and an output. If you're in the for-profit business, you get rated based upon return on investment, share price, all of those kinds of things that are measured by a financial statement. When you're in the non-profit business, money is an input, but it is not an output. If you're the Cleveland Orchestra, standing ovations are the output. If you happen to be TechBridge, our output is sustainable impact. So we're not really a technology services company. You could say that we are. But what we're doing is we're saying we're going to have sustainable impact on people's lives here in Atlanta, and we're going to do it with technology. So what happens is that every time we touch a computer or put a new system in or come up with a new way to do this, we have to say, how is it going to get in, and how is it going to be used, and whose life is it going to impact? And it makes for a whole different conversation when you say, what is the measure of success, and how does that really work? It then feeds into the business model. So when I was building technology companies, you talk to a technology entrepreneur, they're going to talk to you intellectual property, intellectual property, intellectual property. I'm going to build it, I'm going to own it, and I'm going to protect it. So when you're in our business, you want to give it all away. Because every time we put technology in for one nonprofit, which we're doing, we, if we give that access to somebody else in the nonprofit space, we are creating sustainable impact. It's a totally different model. The way that we're doing that is we said the root problem, remember I'm a math major, so I want to look and see what the root problems are and what's the core. The core is affordability for nonprofits. So in the technology sector, technology companies grow businesses to grow revenue lines, which is really great. They build lots of products and lots of services. But when you're in the nonprofit space, a lot of the funders say overhead administrative costs are bad. Mission costs are good. So spend money on your mission. Don't spend money on overhead. Well, guess where technology is in the budget? Overhead, administrative costs. So what that means is that a retail project that would be $50,000, $100,000 to buy in the retail marketplace, a nonprofit has somewhere between three dollars and $5,000 to get that done. So then all of a sudden you say, OK, we're willing to move the intellectual property, but how do we get this done? So what we did is we created a totally new business model that said our business model is based upon sustainable impact. We're going to go to the technology community and we're going to ask for donated technologies. There's actually a whole bunch of technology companies that donate their technology to nonprofits. And we're going to take those that we know that we can get volunteers for, and we're going to actually use technology volunteers in our community and we're going to have them work on those technology projects so we can expand our bandwidth and do more with less. 
And then what we're going to do is we're going to work on the fundamental pro problems. So the other fundamental problem we found in nonprofits is they have lots of paper, lots of it. So they've got, so a good example, I'm going to show you a clip of some of the work that we did. Tom, the Tommy Nova Center trains disabled people. These are vets who have brain damage. There are people who have physical issues. They have all kinds of things. If you donate to NPR here in Atlanta and you get a gift, those <coughs> gifts are fulfilled by the Tommy Nova Center, which is up in Mar Marietta. So they have a bunch of funders, a lot of programs. They train. They have a lot of different programs. And um, you know, they have 900 people. And they have an intake process that took 28 different forms and took them three hours to take one person in because they had to fill it all out and it's all paper, Excel spreadsheets and paper. So we said, we're going to fix that problem. And Accenture is a sponsor of ours and they give us, and they give a technology innovation award. So Tommy Nobis won this technology innovation award. So for $25,000, 2,000 volunteer hours, two robust donated technology platforms, we built a client intake system that the day it was put in, saved an hour and a half out of those three hours. And now the intake process is down to an hour, plus they have all this information. So we're looking at new ways to bring technology partners to the plate and to be able to get this done. One of our, one of our corporate sponsors, um, when we talk to the CIOs, we have a huge technology community. 90, 90 companies in that community provide money and support for TechBridge. When we showed them our business model, some of the for-profit CIOs said, we'd go broke if we had to pay what you pay, because the big companies don't pay what we pay or what the nonprofits pay. So they understood the donated technology and the volunteers and things like that. So one of the things that we're doing with them is say, can you help us build the channel? So we're building kind of new distribution channels using the goodwill and the networks that some of the large companies are building and using their expertise, because we don't have to build it. All we have to do is create sustainable impact with it. So it's, so it's, you know, it's, a, it's very exciting, but we've had to say, in terms of the business models, what are the kinds of things that we're willing to let go, and how are we going to build this in a very di different way? So in the last two years, um, Outside of letting, letting the first five people go, we've had some turnover at TechBridge. But over the last nine months, we've added significant clients. Um, we've created this platform called Transformative Services to get the, to get the paper out. I'll show you a clip about that. Um, you know, we've got companies here in Atlanta who donate our data center space. And like I said, last year we used um, 9,000 volunteer hours. So a good example is we, one of our clients had a sticky pro problem with wireless. They're in a big old building and nobody could fix the wireless, so we called one of our sponsors, and they said, we'll get somebody who knows wireless. They got him there that day. They, they diagnosed it, they fixed it, and they were up and going. Um, one, of the, one of our, sometimes people say, well, why would people do this? You know, why are people volunteering their time? And one of our, one of our volunteers said it the best. He said, have you ever gone up to somebody who loves technology, and you've got a problem, and they go, forget it, I'm not going to help? Because technology people love to fix stuff. You know, we're the biggest problem solvers in the world. And we're geeky about it. So the technology people, by our very nature, we want things to work. And that's one of the reasons why we have such an incredible community. So before we open up for questions, I'd like to show you this clip. So you can see, what does this really look like? What is the human technology?
Okay, questions? Here we go. Good. Uh, can you explain the Mand uh, Mandela model again? I was really confused by that. The, the, the Mandela model? Yes. Let, let's see if I, let, let's, let's try this a second, let's try it and see how this works. But basically the idea is, is that, that the whole company and the community is connected. And so in this connection, what happens is we create all of us who have different roles in the company and we function as pedals, but as individuals we are pedals bringing our capabilities and our functions together and doing what needs to be done. So, so that everybody has basically their own personal responsibility and authority to make good decisions because we're all very clear on what the center is. And then while we have to do one thing that this doesn't really have here is we do have basically a river, if you will, where we need to communicate with folks about what we're doing and how, and how we're, we're able to do that. So in and of itself, it is empowering and everybody knows that they get to bring the light of themselves in, into the company. Yeah. Yeah, so, so what happens is, that, that's, a, that's a really good question, there are certain things that still have to be done. So this does have to sit side by side to being able to say, basically you have to, have to create a structure that says everybody knows what decisions they can make by themselves, what decisions they need to let somebody else know about, and what decisions they have to have <coughs> final, that they have to get approval on. So, so that basically, so that we're sort of wor working that out. So somebody knows that, for example, I have to sign the checks and I approve the budget and the board approves the budget, but we do that because we have to be fiscally responsible and all, and all of that for, for the company. So, so we take it, you know, all the different functions that everybody gets really clear on what has to be re reported. It's just like you would do here, only everybody still has to sort of get clear on what they do, but they know that when they do it, they're adding to the, the community in the work that we do. With your uh, hello, oh, yeah. with your uh, technical and math background, um, can you explain how your degree uh, kind of goes with your business and personal operations as far as sectors concerned? Yeah, I I did some. Um, when one of the things that allowed me to be very successful in the technology world was that um, I could understand basically what was going on. So when we were building healthcare recoveries, for example, a good example is the president of our company was a Wharton grad. So we would go in and we would meet with these folks in the health insurance, you know, the VPs and all that kind of stuff. And he would walk out of the meeting and he would go, boy, that was a good meeting. They said they were going to do this, they said they were going to do that, blah, blah, blah. And I went, it was a terrible meeting because, you know, the body language, you just understood that they were saying all the right things, but they really didn't mean it. And then what we understood was as we told them that we could save them 80% of their costs, we, would, we could return, you know, for a healthcare company, we could return another X percent to their operating margin, which was a big deal. We could do this, we could do that. We gave them all the facts and they would go, hmm, I don't really know. And what we figured out was we could tell them that, but that just got us in the door because what they really wanted to know is could we do what we said that we would do? Could they trust us? And the person making the decision Basically, we're making a decision because their job wasn't necessarily at risk, but if it didn't work out, you know, it's not going to be good. So there was this idea that there's this underlying en energy of which we all really have in terms of what we're doing and the trust that we have and how we operate. So that curiosity then led me into saying, what does that, what does that look like? And so for myself, what I needed to do is find out what that energy is really for me and to be able to understand all of us. So it, it gave me an idea and a way to say in all the different ways you can act and live, everybody gets their choice. So, you know, there's, it's basically living, the technology world allowed me to live in the scene world and the divinity degree allowed me to live in a world that's pretty much unseen. But the idea is, is that we all know love, we all know trust, 
We all know when we feel good. We all feel the love of our, our families, and somehow I needed a framework and a paradigm to be able to put that all together, which is what that did for me. How does one sign up to be a TechBridge volunteer? Great, great. Uh, give me your, your name, and uh, we'll put you to work. Yeah, the, the Georgia Tech, the the, the Georgia Tech students have been absolutely incredible. With there was a, a year ago, there was a group of MBA students who came in and did a marketing survey for us. We don't have a marketing department. We don't have we don't have an accounting department. Our CFO is part time volunteer. He's a retired Deloitte partner. So we have all this stuff. Um, you know, we have a help desk and a knowledge center. So um, so we've used Georgia Tech to help us with the accounting. Uh, we had a Georgia Tech intern this summer. Who was, a, who was in one of Alan's classes. So um, yeah, get, give me your name and we'll put you to work. Yeah. Oh, what, oh was it that, 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 was, that was before me? BK, before Kathleen. Okay. You guys decide um, who's gonna benefit next. What, uh, which nonprofit, do they come to, do they apply to you or do you seek them out or is it, vice, is it a mixture of all that or? It's a mixture. Yeah, um, most nonprofits, the thing about the nonprofit business is most nonprofits have more demand that they can handle. And so our revenue line, we actually get paid by our nonprofits. So the first part of it is, is that we do get paid for the work that we do, but it's just not the full cost of it. Um, and so one of the things about technology is the nonprofits have to be able to pay something which they usually can, but they really also have to be able to want to use the technology and to be able to be ready to, to move the business model. So a lot of the nonprofits have volunteers you know, who do it. Um, so basically any nonprofit who wants our service will you know, sit with them and develop and see what they need. We'll give them a proposal. Um, and then we just kind of see who's, who's able to come on and who's w willing to come on in terms of being able to bring them on. But we're, the nice thing about it, the good and bad news about being a nonprofit is um, with that, is that you know, our working capital, when you look at a traditional model, we have limited working capital, and we don't have the capital markets really to go to. So, so what we have to do, so we're not really a growth business. So that, quest, so that question is every day, how much do we charge? How much margin do we make? You know, how fast can, can we grow in terms of being able to use our capital wisely and stay in business and take care of the clients that we have? Aspect, yes, yes. So, so we actually have, we just, hot, this week, uh, we had hired a new salesperson. Um, we didn't have a salesperson for a while just because we didn't know exactly what we wanted to do with that. So yeah, you, you still need somebody, and it's kind of a salesperson, but really you need somebody to sit down and you know, look at the technology and say, what do you have and how old are your computers and what do you need and how much are you spending? So, so our technology assessments, we get paid a little bit for that, but you know, we do a lot of consulting trying to figure out what works best for you. And our job is whether or not they come to us or go to somebody else, we know that we're helping them because that's part of the, the mission as well. So we're one of those, so when a client goes to somebody else, we'd, you know, we'd like to have them come in the TechBridge family, but we're really happy that we help them make a good decision for themselves. Oh, hey, Michael. What about yourself enables you to be an effective leader in the nonprofit space? What about myself? Um, I have a big heart. And uh, my brain has been well trained. So I know a lot about kind of what the options are. And I think one of the things is, is that I learned a lot of humility when I came to TechBridge because for everything that I've done, and you, know, you could say in some of my life I've been a master of the universe, I had to leave that at the door. Because what I had to do is say, what is it and what do, what do the nonprofits need? And probably the biggest teacher for me with that has been being a parent and raising a daughter. Because what I knew was that when you have a child and being a mom, every single mom wants the best that they can for their children. Whether they can do it or not is a different story. So that heart and my ability to know that there's a way to make, to have access and make this a better place is leading with my heart with humility. And then I've just had enough experience and I'm like stubborn and bullheaded and I 
push through. So uh, it's probably those three things. The good news and bad news is I'm stubborn and push through. Okay. Um, I'm the last question okay. for, uh, uh -oh. for the I day. Know, I knew she was going to ask me a question. It, it, it's, not, it's, it's not a hard one. Uh, but you came into TechBridge when it was about eight years old, and it was already established as a 501c3 nonprofit company. Correct. Uh, in ter if you were setting up the uh, business plan now, would you do it as a nonprofit uh, or a for-profit or not even to put you on the spot, uh, you know, on video? Um, what, uh, what are the benefits and the, uh, to, to being nonprofit and also the barriers uh, to serving by being nonprofit and how would the world perhaps be better served or worse served if you were for-profit? You know, one of the big big pluses about being a nonprofit is that it allows the technology community to participate with us in a way that they would not otherwise if we are for profit. So when we talk to the technology community, we say, we, you know, we need your dollars to support us because we need to pay our people and pay the bills. But what we really need is we need access to your technology and to your people. And we believe that giving and passioning technology people to share their technology with the community is so overwhelmingly positive for the community as a whole. Because technology people are, can go build habitat houses, they can clean up parks, but when you say to a technology person, you know SharePoint, I've got the SharePoint project for you, and they go, oh my gosh, I can use this talent, I can get it done, and I get paid in hugs, and I get paid in smiles, it is really incredible. So being a nonprofit really allows us to be able to get that done. And so we're building community in the technology community that nobody else has been able to do because we actually, on projects, the Tommy Nobis pro project, we had competitors in the technology space working together on a project to be able to get that done. And so it's really an incredible way to have a conversation with folks and kind of raise their awareness and their consciousness. Now, the part of not being a nonprofit, if I think for this space it's important to be a nonprofit because what I would say is if we were building this as a for profit technology company, we would not have the clients that we have. So, because of the affordability and the ability to pay. So, there are a lot of technology companies who are working in the nonprofit space. In fact, the first time I did a Google search, and search for technology services for nonprofits, I got 77 million hits. Second time, I got 123 million hits, technology services for nonprofits. So now it's not quite as many, but Google has changed in their search cri criteria. So, so what happens is, is that a lot of for-profit companies are coming at this space, but they're coming at it with a for-profit business model. So I think being a nonprofit also gives us the freedom to create and gives us the freedom to get the best of the best and create a business model that, re that really works. Because basically, you know, we have to figure out how to get really expensive technology into nonprofits for just a small amount. And in fact, one of my, um, there, there were two models that I took with me into TechBridge that I found when I was on the faculty at Georgia Tech. And the one, one of the models was how do you build infrastructure projects in developing countries? And what happens is if you needed to get water to a village in a, in a developing country where there was no water, you would get grant money to build the plant, and then you would make it so it was operat operating sustainably that the villagers could afford to pay for the money and to pay for that water to come the last mile to their house. So when you look at our transformative services, that's actually the business model, which if, is when we make technology affordable and bring donated technology together with volunteers with some new methodologies, then in fact, that's what we're doing. We're building the plant and we're making it affordable so that we can make it sustainable. So, so we actually took that business model that's not used at all in the for-profit space. The other business model that we used was the idea that's done in the microfinance world, which is the key to microfinance and its success, in my opinion, which is the circles of women sitting around in collaboration groups helping each other solve the problem. So a lot of times in technology, because we say, oh, here's the problem and we know how to fix it, 
the problem isn't really addressed and people don't know how they want to fix it in the nonprofit. So we took that collaboration model and said once we put nonprofits together and they're collaborating with it, we're going to take that model, we're going to put it in the technology space so that we can get really smart people around the table sharing what they know and then we're going to be able to move that out. So, so I, I would say you know, for this business being a nonprofit has given us many degrees of freedom to go and experiment. Um, and it's, you know, I've also been involved in, a, in private companies and in pub public companies. And, you know, when you're in a private company, um, you do have more, more bandwidth to go and have freedom to create because you don't have to report to the market. And that, that's a really good thing. And I like freedom, so I like the freedom to be able to create. And this, this has a lot of freedom in it. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.